Hey everyone, welcome back to the OnScript Podcast. This is Matt Lynch coming to you from Regent College in Vancouver. And I thought for this episode, it'd be really fun to go back to our very first episode that we did with OnScript. This is back in 2016 when Matt Bates and I had just started the podcast. And our very first guest was Dr. Munther Isaac. And uh, he actually has a new book out you should be aware of called The Other Side of the Wall, Palestinian Christian Narrative of Lament and Hope. Uh, published by InterVarsity Press uh, about uh, two years ago. And uh, as as you'll be able to tell, the audio quality was pretty shoddy at that point. And we've definitely improved since then. That was before we had Ed Hatkey to clean up any mess we made um, on the audio side. And I just had no clue what I was doing. But anyway, it was fun. And uh, I, I have always appreciated uh, Munther Isaac's work. And I, I think you'll find this conversation illuminating and interesting. And I also just want to remind you that we have our In Parallel podcast up and running, so do check that out. Uh, It's a different kind of podcast, and I think it's really exciting and um, gotten good feedback so far. And uh, that's hosted by Brent Strawn, and the focus of that podcast is the intersection between biblical and contemporary poetry. And if poetry is not your thing, still check it out because I think it will draw you into that world. Uh, Brent does a great job with that. So check it out. Also, we have our Biblical World podcast focused on the history, archaeology, context of the Bible. Lots of episodes there uh, for you to enjoy. New stuff coming out uh, pretty much every week these days. So uh, thanks so much for listening, and thanks again to Ed Hackey for saving us from this kind of audio. Um, But I still thought the interview was worth listening. So enjoy. We have as our very distinguished first guest, Dr. Munther Isaac of Bethlehem Bible College, who's here to discuss his recently published book, From Land to Lands, From Eden to the Renewed Earth, A Christ-Centered Biblical Theology of the Promised Land, which was published by Lang and Monographs in 2015. Munther, thank you for joining us. You are welcome. The the pleasure is mine. So, Dr. Isaac is academic dean and assistant professor of biblical studies at Bethlehem Bible College in Palestine, and he completed his PhD at the Oxford Center for Mission Studies and has an MA from Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. And he's also actively involved in Musalaha, um, reconciliation ministry he organizes, um, or that he is part of, and he also organizes the uh, Christ at the Checkpoint Conference, which happens every other year, and I'm also I'm actually hoping to attend this uh, this coming March. Is it seven March seven to ten? Is that right? Yes, it's March seventh to tenth, and it's a conference that uh, we at Bethlehem Bible College do uh, every two years uh, to look at issues like the theology of the land, uh, but while grounding it in the context and the, the reality on the ground as we have it in Palestine and Israel. Mm. So yes. Yeah, I, I've been sort of. Uh, if you if you look at Christ, is it Christ at the Checkpoint dot com? Is that right? Absolutely, exactly. Christ at the Checkpoint dot com. Yeah, I definitely encourage people to go watch uh, the the previous um, conferences, which are recorded, and you can you can look at those um, the uh, talks that were given at those uh, in the past. Uh, so before getting into your book, I'm wondering if you could give our listeners some background on you and where you grew up, where you grew up, and uh, how that context, how the context in Palestine has shaped your work and scholarship. Well, I am uh, a Palestinian Christian, and uh, I grew up uh, in Bethlehem, actually in Beit Sahur, which is more of the uh, Shepherd's Field uh, area known here, and. Um, all my life, I've seen the conflict firsthand as a Palestinian living under uh, occupation. And uh, themes like the conflict, um, occupation, reconciliation, peacemaking, or resistance, all of these are just part of our uh, daily conversations and part of our reality, uh, more or less. Uh, even today, as, as I speak to you and as we give lectures at the Bible College, just outside the Bible College, there's uh, demonstrations and tear gas in our campus. So this is actually a uh, part of life here. And so um, it's in this context that we serve, and it's this context that I was uh, raised. Hmm. So as you set out to write this book uh, on the land, uh, Biblical Theology of the Land, what were some of the specific questions that you were bringing to Scripture 
uh, that come from your context? Well, my my interest in the topic of the theology of the land, uh, to be honest, grew from engagement with, uh, first of all, um, uh, Zionist the- the Jewish theology about the land, uh, using the Old Testament to justify the occupation of Palestinian land, and uh, even sometimes to justify the uprooting of Palestinians from their villages and homes, uh, and so, uh, you know, for example, my family has been living in the Bethlehem area for at least five to six hundred years. And now all of a sudden, um, our Bible or the Old Testament part of it, at least, is used to justify our uprooting. And so that 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 made some sort of a spiritual threat to us. Uh, what about scripture and, and so on? So that's the first part. Why? Uh, I was interested in studying this topic uh, with with the uh, simple and innocent question: Did God promise my land to my enemy? And, and do these promises hold for today? In what sense? Uh, but the second major element, which really pushed me to study this topic, is what we heard constantly as Palestinian Christians from uh, many Christians around the world, especially uh, in the West, uh, who more or less um, uh, affirmed that message we heard that actually God did indeed give this land to Israel and that the state of Israel is a fulfillment of prophecy and as such um, Jews have a divine right to live in this land which again makes me wonder so where is the gospel for me in this? So I'm wondering if you could give our listeners an overview of your book. So my book um, is a systematic, what I would call diachronic, uh, look at the theme of the land in all of scripture, beginning from uh, the Garden of Eden to the book of Revelation, uh, looking at that theme of sacred geography or uh, a piece of land that God deals in a special way with uh, with his people. And I think um, one of the major uh, contributions of this book is that um, I argued that the right place to begin the study of the theology of the land is actually in the creation narrative, and in particular in the Garden of Eden. Uh, and so the first chapter of this book is actually about the theology of the land in Eden, which uh, argues or assumes that uh, the land, uh, uh, that the Garden of Eden is kind of an image of the land or is a type of the land, and Adam of Eve are uh, proto-Israel. Uh, and in that sense, the relationship between Israel and the land is prefigured in this relationship between Adam and Eve and Eden. Uh, And Eden, I argued, was um, first of all a a place that mediated the presence of God. And so this is the whole term of holiness, the presence of God in it. Uh, A presence that sanctifies. And this actually became my first theme in the book, the land as holy. Uh, And then I saw that Eden was actually a covenanted land. Uh, in that when God gave Eden to Adam and Eve, um, he gave it to them with a responsibility. There were clear commandments to take care of it and uh, uh, to be kind of uh, God's uh, vicegerents, as the language I use, uh, God's representatives uh, on, in Eden. Uh, and so hence the covenanted land is my second theme. And my third theme is that Eden was like a royal garden where Adam and Eve are uh, royal figures in the Garden of Eden. And so my third theme in the Old Testament is that uh, the land uh, embodies the reign of God on earth. And so from the Garden of Eden, I was able to come with these three themes, that the land is a place that mediates the presence of God, the land is a place that mediates God's ideals, hence it's covenanted, and the land is a place that embodies the reign of God, where God's will abides. Um, 
And in all of these three elements, there is always a universal dimension uh, because Eden is in the center of creation. Eden, if you wish, blesses the whole uh, universe. Uh, and I found that beginning in the Garden of Eden does at least two things. Uh, the first is that it underlines the ethical and moral responsibility with the, that comes with the gift of land. So land is, is more, or Eden and the land are more of a, of a mandate, of a responsibility given to us by God, uh, for the benefit of all of creation. And the second element that was highlighted is, is this particular one that, uh, the universal dimension. Uh, for I found out that many times when biblical studies begins in uh, Genesis 12, the focus sometimes is too narrow. It's just on Israel, Israel's mission or Israel's theology. Whereas beginning in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 actually uh, underscores the universal element in the story of Israel and in the theology uh, of the land. So if, if I could jump in on that point real quick. Um, how how does it work? This is one of the questions I have when I was reading. How does it work that Eden is both the prefiguration of Israel, but also um, underscoring the universal dimension of the land of Israel? How can it, how does it work together that it's both of those things? Well, because Israel's mission is universal, and I think that is something that we also miss many times. Uh, and again, we just focus on Israel, Israel's theology, uh, while forgetting that Israel was created from the beginning uh, to bless humanity. So uh, the first story of Israel, actually, uh, of the moment Israel begins in scripture, uh, in salvation history at least, is in uh, Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Uh, and that passage concludes with the promise that in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth, uh, shall be blessed. And I argue that that blessing to all the families of the earth is, is more or less echoing God's call to uh, Adam and Eve to multiply and subdue the earth. Uh, and so that universal element is always part of the mission of those chosen by God. And in that sense, Israel becomes uh, the second Adam or Adam take two, if you wish, uh, more modern language. Two point uh, it's, <laughs> Yes, it's, it's, it's God's uh, attempt to redeem humanity at all costs. And so what Adam failed in, which is basically bringing order to the universe as God's representative in Eden, now Israel is supposed to fulfill bringing order to the universe from the land uh, of Canaan. Um, so so on, on that theme... Um, you know, one of the questions I get a lot when I teach Old Testament is why God went with a very particular specific people at that point. You know, is there is there any logic revealed to us in Scripture regarding the choice of one specific family, one specific nation, um, as opposed to kind of the restart that we get in Genesis 9 with Noah and kind of all humanity again? I, I think that... It's a, it's a good question. Uh, it's a question that typically our students ask here. Uh, why Israel out of all people? And of course, uh, in their mind, they're thinking of the uh, modern situation or the of the current reality. And I think if you just look at scripture uh, and look at uh, Genesis 11, the whole story uh, ends with all these nations scattered around the earth. And so God looks at the field and just picks one. Uh, and why Why that? I mean, if he had picked another family, we would ask the same question. And so it's it's left to God's sovereign will, if you wish. And interestingly, there is nothing uh, in Genesis 11 or 12 that actually tells us why Abraham. Just, uh, it's, it's in the will of God. We, I mean, uh, later, uh, Abraham has to earn it. Um, more or less, I mean, when, when he is tested, uh, when he is commanded to give Isaac as a sacrifice. I mean, that's a different story, but when he was chosen in the very beginning, uh, there is nothing, and I, and I think it, the same applies, uh, with, uh, you know, why Isaac and not Ishmael, uh, why Jacob and not Esau, and I think the question is, 
uh, it's God who's who's calling the shot here. It's not human uh, will. It's not human. Nothing we merit. Nothing we do that merits that uh, that election. Yeah. So so one of the things that you highlight in the book, and I thought this was really helpful, was that while on the one hand the election itself is unconditional, there are conditions attached to the possession of the promise, or the possession specifically of the land given to Abraham and then Israel. And that that's really important for uh, biblical theology of the land. Yes. I think that yeah, in, in biblical st- scholarship, often there is this dichotomy between whether the blessings were, or the promises were conditional or unconditional. And I think, I, I argue that actually the Bible comes with a new concept of an, uh, a gift that comes with, with conditions or, uh, you know, that it's the same, it's two coins with two different, one coin with two different faces and we cannot separate. Uh, it's a gift, but uh, it comes with, with, with conditions. Um, and that is important because on the one hand, it underscores against the gracious nature of God. But on the other, it, it underscores his, uh, his ethical nature that he's a God who demands that his people uh, behave in a certain way that reflects his image, the image of uh, justness and kindness and, and mercy. Uh, and by the way, uh, you mentioned the word possession, you know, uh, and that's when I would argue that uh, it's because of this that the, la- the land never actually becomes a possession of the people of God. It's always a mandate. It's always a responsibility or a duty. You know, Walter Brueggemann came with this uh, concept of mandated land, and I, and I agree 100%. Uh, in that, even when the land was given, uh, you know, Leviticus 25 and the whole laws of the Jubilee, actually God reminds Israel, it never becomes yours. It's, it's, it's given for the, uh, benefit of the community. Uh, it's given so that its uh, resources are shared equally, but you should never sell it because it's not your property, so that you make it kind of a, uh, something that you gain from, something that, that that you become rich even from. So you, you talk about, and I I don't know if you picked this up from Beale or if just you sort of agree with him, but he he talks about the idea of Eden expanding, and so you you linked the notion of Eden from chapter two of Genesis with the call to to fill and subdue the earth in chapter one of Genesis, and I w- one of the things that makes me where I'm a little uneasy about that is that in general, like the idea of territorial expansion is, um, it doesn't seem very at home in Old Testament thinking about the nation of Israel. There, I mean, there is certainly the subjugation of the allotted borders, whatever they are, and you talked about them shifting. But the idea that Eden, that this idealized place, which is then sort of taken up in Israel, would expand to cover the earth seems like a, a kind of Babylonian, Assyrian vision of world domination, where in the prophets you actually have the vision of the nations coming to Israel to learn a different way, but there's still that plurality of different nations. And so rather than expanding to cover the earth, Israel serves as a model to be replicated throughout the earth. What do you, what do you think um, about that? I think uh, you're right in that... I think what I try to emphasize more is the idea of uh, influence that Eden uh, expands through its influence, not necessarily the borders. And I cite Beal as just an, an example who, you know, would say Beal would even say that it expanded. But did I really push for the idea that the borders of Eden themselves expand? Mm. Well, I I have to go back and look, but you do use the language of expansion, and I think. And, and it, but you also talk about Israel as a model and to be replicated. And I just felt like those two things maybe were collapsed and it would be helpful to distinguish the kind of expansion through influence from border expansion. Well, in the end, so here my language is still, you know, um, symbolic and all of that. But in the end of the book, I spoke about three uh, ways of uh, universalization of the land. 
uh, which I think I was talking about the land, but here it, you can apply it to Eden, and uh, they are um, uh, one of them is expansion. So from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth, to Samaria, Judea to the ends of the earth. The other is, uh, I think, uh, by multiplication. So you, uh, the land is universalized when Israel becomes the model, or you take that's when from land to lands. That's my whole idea. So universalization by expansion, then by multiplication. Well, I forgot the word I used. And the third one is universalization and the consummation. So that's when the whole new earth is is becomes one big uh, land where God reigns. Uh, so it's not necessarily expansion. It's more that we need to go beyond the borders of Eden or Israel. Uh, God's reign is not confined to that narrow area. So one of the things that you know, is always in my mind uh, as I'm hearing you talk and then reading through the book was what are the points of um, you know contact between the work you're doing in, in scripture and your context and you know one of the things that that came up a lot was this idea of of um, you know conditions for maintaining the land um, as a, a gift or as a um, temporary possession uh, maybe possession is the right word so so what are, what are the some of the specific conditions for um, land retention that you feel have the most modern relevance for you and that are maybe overlooked by, say, um, Zionist Christians or, you know, Christians of a dispensational leaning? You know, in my book, I argue that uh, there are, uh, uh, you know, just for way of classification, three um, themes that were emphasized uh, uh, that, that break the covenant. Uh, the first is, you know, worshiping God and idolatry and just worshiping God alone. Uh, the second has to do with the Jubilee laws and the Sabbath laws. Uh, and the third one has to do with uh, the covenant and in particular with justice. Uh, uh, and uh, interestingly, probably the one that we find more verses on in the Bible and more emphasis on, especially uh, but not exclusively in the prophetic tradition, is, is the issue of justice. Uh, socio-economic justice, and uh, in biblical terms, the emphasis was on uh, four four categories: uh, the poor, the orphan, uh, the widow, and the sojourner. And it's how you treat those four categories uh, that determines whether, uh, let's use biblical terms, the land will uh, host you or the land will, sorry to say, vomit you. I mean, that's language of Leviticus uh, 18. And by the way, um, uh, you know, I, I definitely want to connect this with the current situation right now uh, in Palestine and Israel. But this is by no means uh, exclusive to this land. I think this applies to any land. Mm-hmm. That's part of my New Testament. Yeah. I think that these, uh, the, these themes of the theology of the land were uh, universalized. And so what I say is actually applicable uh, to, to England or to uh, United States and any, anywhere in the world. So I think that justice is sometimes ignored. Um, uh, I feel that uh, issues like uh, equality and um, socioeconomic justice sometimes uh, are, are overlooked by many Christians, where we feel that just part of uh, our Christian charity because we're nice, we do it. But actually, um we need a more holistic approach, and I think that's one of the things I hope I accomplish in this book, is showing that uh, the mission of the people of God is a whole package that includes uh, the emphasis on socio-economic justice, bringing God's ideals on earth. It's not simply about submitting hearts to God, but about hum- submitting societies to God and, and whole structures uh, to God. And so as I look in Palestine and Israel, the question of justice is absolutely um, very important to us. And uh, uh, there is a lot from our perspective as Palestinians, a lot of injustices happening uh, on the ground, a lot of uh, land confiscation uh, by the strong, by uh, Israel uh, confiscating Palestinian land. Uh, There are laws that discriminate between certain ethnicities or certain uh, nationalities. And so uh, these issues, I believe, at, at the heart of the theology of the land. It's not just, you know, we need to be nice as Christians, but 
Um, if, if any theology we have discriminates or ends up giving different rights to two different peoples, I think there's something absolutely wrong with that theology, and it's definitely not biblical. Hmm. So, so moving then to your argument regarding the New Testament, because this is, I think, where for a lot of Christians, maybe, you know, interpretations differ, and where I think your work is, is really helpful and important. So, so some people argue, uh, let, let's say on the kind of dispensationalist, uh, Zion, Zionist uh, camp, that the, the promises of God to Israel regarding the future possession of the land still obtain. Okay, so that that's on the one hand, there's that group. But then even for those who see the church inheriting the promises to Israel, some of them say the the promises of, of the land have been spiritualized. And you're actually resistant in your book to both of those approaches. I'm wondering if you could comment on both of them and why, or you know, explain your alternative. Well, with the first one, arguing that the promises of the land are valid uh, to Israel, uh, I would argue, uh, ignores the New Testament argument or the New Testament claims that uh, A, Jesus is the fulfillment of Israel. He continues the story of Israel. He embodies Israel. Uh, the story of Israel finds its culmination in him. And as such as the new Israelite, he inherits the land, making now when he, you know, the, the famous claim in Matthew 28, all authorities on earth and in heaven has been given to me. I think that's an important verse for the theology of the land. When Jesus says, you know, now I continue to read the story of Israel, all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. Uh, and that, not only that, you know, uh, Galatians 3 says that Jesus is the only offspring of Abraham. You cannot, there, there are no other offsprings, Paul would say, with the, the plural and insisting there is only one of them, that is Jesus. And so, if you say that the land promises were not fulfilled yet, then you are, in a, in, in, in a sense, denying those claims by the New Testament. And then, more importantly, denying the claims of, for example, Galatians 3, which say that those who are in Jesus inherit the promises. Uh, conclusions of uh, Galatians 3, uh, when Paul says, now that you are into Jesus, it's through faith. No Jew, no Gentile, no male, no female, no free, nor slave. Those who are baptized into Jesus are Christ, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendant, heirs according to the promise. And of course, we, we question what do we inherit, if not everything that comes with the story uh, of Israel. And so ironically, uh, many times we are accused by the dispensational camp of spiritualizing uh, the Bible, especially the Old Testament, I feel that it's actually the dispensational camp that spiritualizes verses like uh, Galatians 3.26, which says, you inherit the promises. Because what do I, what do I inherit? Uh, uh, if not everything that comes with the story uh, of Israel. Uh, and so, you know, the New Testament, and I hope that, you know, uh, was argued, uh, this was what I argued in the book, that the New Testament is the New Testament that claims that Jesus fulfills the story of Israel. Hmm. Yeah, and and you also make the interesting point I had never, never really thought about that um, the the sort of entry into the land um, idea is accomplished right on the cross, and even Jesus' word, you know, words to the thief next to him that today you will be with me in paradise, um, linking back to Eden, uh, is a is a kind of reopening of Eden as a possibility for um, for the people at that point. That that's the kind of and, and I was also thinking of the verse in in Luke, I think it's nine, where uh, Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration talking about the Exodus that he's about to accomplish in Jerusalem. So there you have the kind of Exodus and land entry happening right there um, in the Passion and Crucifixion. So what does your study of the land have to offer to Israeli and Palestinian or other Messianic uh, Christians trying to think through on the ground how to respond to uh, the, the conflict in the, in the land of Israel-Palestine? I think um, 
the theology of the land that uh, I uh, articulated um, aims to bring God's ideals and, uh, and and ground them into reality. And so the theology of the land, uh, the land becomes the sphere where God's uh, will, purposes, even ideals are implemented. Uh, and so this is the original land where it all, all it all started. And this is, I argued, the model where that, that the church should kind of copy everywhere in the world. So how much more should we do it here? And so that's why I, I spoke in, in my book about this idea of a shared land uh, theology, uh, in particular uh, in, uh, in, you know, in relation to this particular context we find ourselves in. Uh, whereas we promote, we speak, we, uh, we speak of a theology where the whole idea is that we have to share the land equally as God's uh, people. Uh, in other words, um, there should be no ex- exclusive language, uh, no privileges to any ethnicity or religion when it comes to living in this land. So uh, this whole notion of a shared land brings everyone to equal grounds. As, as human beings, all of us created in God's image, we're all uh, under this mandate to take care of the land and bring God's ideal. And as such, the church plays an integral role. Yes, we are a minority here. But we have to continue to be that prophetic role, a prophetic voice uh, that challenges authorities and calls for uh, um, calls for uh, justice and peace. And uh, as, as Palestinian Christians, uh, we have often insisted that uh, there will be uh, no peace uh, unless the the occupation uh, ends, until the occupation ends, and and that is actually the path we envision. Uh, for justice uh, and for peace. So justice leads to peace. The end of the occupation leads to peace. And uh, as long as there is this imbalance uh, in power and as long as there are two laws on the ground today where laws that sometimes discriminate and privilege uh, people over others, uh, one faith or one ethnicity over the other, uh, then I believe that is an obstacle towards creating uh, lasting peace uh, in this land. So, so in the, the space between now and the possibility of the occupation ending, what do you see as the primary role of the church, uh, with regard to, uh, the disputes over the land? Well, um, uh, Jesus said, blessed are uh, the peacemakers. And, uh, I wonder sometimes if we take him, uh, seriously or whether we think that's, as I said, sometimes, uh, just a way uh, how we treat our neighbor. You know, if uh, your neighbor is noisy, then blessed are the peacemaker. I think he's talking much more about uh, political and social uh, realities. And um, many times I feel that the church, especially in the West, if I am uh, honest, and, and within the evangelical world, has been looking at this land uh, through the lens of uh, prophecy and uh, speculation about end time scenarios. And uh, it is my hope that uh, we have some sort of a paradigm shift where Christians around the world begin looking at this land and the conflict here uh, through the lens of the kingdom and ask, uh, what would Jesus have us do? Uh, how do we respond uh, the Jesus way? How do we uh, walk in Jesus' footsteps if he comes and walks in this land uh, today? And I think that Jesus has a lot to teach us, uh, whether it's in the Sermon uh, on the Mountain or whether it's in his lifestyle. Uh, it's in his teaching about that the meek shall inherit the, the land. And, uh, um, you know, there are many elements that we can uh, apply. And so it is our hope uh, here. We, we keep saying as Palestinian Christians that uh, the church adopts this mentality that uh, we can make a difference and we can actually bring uh Israelis and Palestinians uh, together um, if if there is a true will. Hmm. Is, is there anything that you see happening on the ground that gives you reason for hope? Um, well, just a um, few minutes from where I am right now, uh, Christ was risen, and that is the ultimate reason why we keep hoping in this land. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a reminder that... Uh, we can never lose hope when we have faith uh, in God. Uh, but also at the ground, I think, the fact that the church survived here in this land, 
uh, for all of these years, despite the different challenges and uh, occupations and uh, invasions. Uh, it's a testimony to God's faithfulness, and it's a sign of hope. Uh, I would even point to uh, many um, uh, things that are happening on the ground, many uh, grassroots movements. Some are Christian, uh, faith-based, and some are just, uh, you know, uh, done out of goodwill of Palestinians and Israelis coming together and meeting and saying no to violence and no to the occupation and no to the current situation. Uh, and I believe that uh, in a time when uh, we have lost hope in politics and we have lost hope in um, UN uh, regulations and politicians, I see in these grassroots uh, grass, uh, movements, uh, and some of them, as I said, are uh, Christian-based that bring, aim to bring Christians from both sides together. I see hope in these in these movements. Well, Mathieu, thank you so much for, for taking the time to speak with me. I just want to um, alert our listeners to the fact that Mathieu's book is available, of course, on Amazon. Uh, we're going to have a link on our website for you to check it out and buy a copy. I definitely recommend it. I thought it was a fantastic, uh, the most thorough going, um, substantial uh, theology of the uh, biblical theology of the land that I've read. And I thought it was very well done, of course, very relevant to not only your situation, but other um, situations of land dispute. So, Mother, this was fun. Thanks so much for joining OnScript. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you.